Hi, my name is Michael Rizzi, and I've been watching a lot of porn over the last month. Hold on, I'll explain. I've been seeing these subscription platforms pop up all over social media, such as OnlyFans and Just For Fans. Platforms where people, largely queer men, can create and upload their own adult content. And I mean, you could access so many different types of content on these platforms, all neatly organized and priced around $8 to $12 a month per page. These platforms have started the Netflix generation of amateur porn stars. And I'm fascinated by it. Out of the 33 0.5 billion visitors to Pornhub in 2018. What genre kept viewers watching the most for an average of 15 minutes and 25 seconds? Amateur porn, or content that was filmed and produced by the performers themselves. For the purposes of this video, we're gonna refer to this type of content as NSFW, not safe for work, and the producers of this content, NSFW creators. Before we dive into the wild world of NSFW content creation, I decided to chat with sex researcher Eva Bloom to see what an academic thinks about this industry shift. Hi, my name's Eva Bloom. I'm 23 from Toronto, and I am an academic, a sex researcher. So a big part of my research has been looking at how sexting can be related to communication with partners about STIs and also desires. I think technology in general can be a really great tool of helping people communicate with their partners and learn more about themselves sexually in kind of lower stakes environments. For example, if you think you might be interested in something like exhibitionism or voyeurism, you can check out a really cool video on OnlyFans or many vids um, and kind of explore that without having to participate in anything yourself if you're not comfortable with. And I'm also always a big fan of sending a video to a partner being like, I found this and I think that might be, <laughs> might be kind of hot. I thought it would be important to chat with one of the people leading that new technology. So I had a call with Dominic Ford, the founder of Just For Fans. So could you please explain to me like what is Just For Fans? So Just For Fans is definitely a porn site. So all of our performers are sex worker somehow, whether that means that they have hardcore sex on film or they're just doing solos or uh, they just have erotic photos. So a lot of people watching this know nothing about NSFW platform. So what is something you might want them to know about Just For Fans? Oh, it's a it's a huge platform. It's a platform uh, where, where models can communicate with each other, where they can uh, create content and share it with their fans. They can monetize all the interactions that they have with their fan base. Our top models earn over $100,000 a year. I have to repeat that because that's a, a crazy notion. Uh, again, being in the porn industry for 11 years and knowing what these models make, for them to pull $100,000 a year on content that they now own and control. So there's an empowerment, not only in these models making money on their own terms, but selling their image and being in control of their own content in the future, which is a huge a huge difference. After chatting with Dominic, I knew it was important to hear from NSFW creators directly. So I booked a ticket, packed my bags, headed to the airport, and started documenting their stories. So I am here in beautiful sunny Los Angeles to chat with Blake and Chad. They're a couple who create their NSFW content together. To be honest, I was a bit intimidated to meet two very popular porn performers, but it didn't take long for me to realize they're just like any old couple. He was walking out of the house and he was like, what are you going to be doing? I'm going to do steak bowls. He was like, I was just kind of like, like, I was like, this isn't Chipotle. Like, like what I'm are you doing? I'm going to slap you right now. Yeah. <laughs> you sure you want to do it that way? Can you <laughs> stop acting like you know what you're doing here? <laughs> so we've been doing OnlyFans content together for uh, a little over a year. And with this, I think, and I think this is why some people like it so much, they can tell that you're connected to the process from beginning to end. You're deciding it, you're setting it up, you're creating it, you're editing it, you're releasing it. Mm -hmm. For the people who have that little exhibitionist in them, you know, and they want to experience that, it's a great way to do it. Yeah, it's a great, it's on your own safe terms. way for them to be in control of doing it too. We're in an, an era where the studios aren't the ones that are the stars, you know, it's the models. And a lot of those models are taking that power back from the studios. I, do, I still do scenes, but very, very, uh, much more sparingly. And I do the scenes now actually to get access to the studio's audience. So we, we do a homemade approach. Very amateur. And um, I don't know about very amateur. It's just am not in a bad way. It's just, it's not... It's not like, sh like there's no cameraman. No, we would be having sex and our phone was like right on the side of the bed and I would pull it out, you know, do selfie style or, you know, he would do POV style. Or we plan it as we're like about to start shooting it. Like, oh, let's put the phone over here so we have this angle or let's put the phone here and do a POV. But we're planning it like right before we're doing it. So it's still very spontaneous. And we're definitely not like storyboarding anything by any means. 
So the traditional porn world, right, exists uh, like under the old Hollywood mo uh, model, where studios um, own the actors in some form or another through a form of an exclusive contract. So that means, let, let's say you're gonna film one scene a month, so that's 12 scenes over a year. Maybe you film two scenes one month, maybe you film none the next, whatever. It's 12 scenes for a year. That's basically what you owe them. There's like a lot of problems with that. For one, um, I think people should be in charge of their own bodies, like period, at a story. So if I want to stop filming, I should be able to stop filming. I think that's just as simple as that. And I think that's one thing that OnlyFans has caused a major shift in the industry is you see a lot fewer people signing exclusive contracts. After chilling with their dog Bandit, playing video games, and being a low-key porn director, I headed back to my hotel, packed my bags, and flew to Vancouver. I would like to acknowledge that this is taking place on the unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish nations. Well, I've been creating NSFW content for quite a while, even before I was 18. Um, and now, actually, I've just started becoming more open with it and more accepting and just knowing, no, I don't like any of that. Well, hello, my name is Morgan Whitehead, online Kenny Walk. I guess I would say I'm two-spirited indigenous. This is just a regular, casual, chill little whip made out of leather. It produces a lot of uh, sound, more so than uh, actual pain. I do use it in quite a few of my videos, um, maybe a little bit too much. This is the original jock strap that I was gonna wear. Look at this nice, amazing coverage here. And one thing actually many people don't know about indigenous people, indigenous communities, is that sex workers were highly respected in many nations across Turtle Island. It kind of feels like this is um, taking back part of my, my past identity. And it might only seem like it's just sex work, but it's not just sex work, or it's not just sex or videos. It's really making a connection. Well, sex work and escorting had a place in many indigenous communities. Uh, they were highly respected. They weren't regarded as anything less than. They had a place in the community uh, because, you know, sex is just something that humans need. Most of my videos actually just happen in my bedroom. I just have like a webcam, it's just very easy to set up. Um, I like to host. Paintings, well, a lot of my paintings are traditionally inspired and I would say that I do take some of my inspiration here and apply it to my NSW content. I feel like it really helps me stay connected to who I am as an artist. Not very many people see porn as art but it really is. And a large portion of that art for me is acceptance. And that's where a lot of the acceptance of other nations, um, older or younger or fat, skinny, white, black, Asian, um, that's where a lot of, that's where my love and passion comes for creating videos and making connections. Hearing Morgan's story reminded me that outside the mainstream, disenfranchised voices aren't experiencing the same NSFW life. I hopped on a video call with Max Connor, who's both an outspoken porn performer and NSFW content producer. So I started actually with my own personal content. A lot of people don't know that. Um, that's how I started. Um, it was back in 2017 and I decided that I would uh, get into porn. So I started posting, I, I created a Twitter account and I started posting uh, like these random videos that I had of me uh, with guys. And then it all evolved into me starting the OnlyFans and I'm creating more, I guess, quality-based content. My, my primary goal is, because when I first started this, it was to show myself um, in a real light. I always wanted to have it the best quality I could possibly get it but still be in the realm of homemade porn. Because there's a lot of what I call overproduced homemade porn out there. <laughs> How do you feel about the lack of representation from people of color in mainstream porn? Is NSFW content filling that gap or are we still really far off? Well, I think it's a two-fold question. I think the problem is still persisting, but I also do think it's helpful in the fact that models of color get a chance to 
present themselves and create a brand for themselves. Whereas before, when we didn't have this, we kind of relied on studios to do that for us. And now we have the opportunity to take that into our own hands and we work hard enough to accomplish something really great from it. As I was traveling back to Toronto, I made plans to chat with Max Spade, whose story of survival sex and homelessness added another layer of understanding. My name is Aaron O'Neill. My poor name is Max Spade. I've done a lot of stuff. I've been working since about 15 years old. Right now I have a degree in landscape architecture. I'm off work on a temporary leave and I've been just creating porn to survive. I shoot my content everywhere, outdoors, um, in my car, people's places. I'm currently homeless, so I kind of shoot wherever I seek refuge or wherever people let me. I create this content uh, just to make money, really, uh, to make ends meet, um, to pay back my student loan, to survive. Kink is very hard to define. It's a lot like love for me. Um, it's different for everybody. I mean, there are people that I've met who think kinky is, you know, like a feather or something. And I'm just like, no, that's more erotic. And so there's all of these different definitions of what people are, are comfortable with calling kinky or what people are comfortable calling taboo. And it's, for me, I mean, it's all about just what you uh, get aroused by most. You know, like I've got a lot of kinks, but it's because I'm a really creative person and I, and I get aroused by so many different things, but they're all little kinks in my sexual um, journey. For me personally, that's it. You know, I don't, a lot of other people are so much more successful. Some people I know that just literally put a video out there, they don't even edit it, it just sells itself. I don't think I have that luxury. I don't know, I've tried that. Like, I really do have to hustle. And then there's people like me who are like, <laughs> you know, doing everything they can. <laughs> I mean, people on Chatterbait, people throw like pennies at you, basically they're nickels. And so you, you, know, you hear that bell ringing, but you know they're nickels, you know, like it's a lot of work um, and they take a big cut. Yeah, this is, uh, this is where I ended up homeless in my third year of university. Right behind that beautiful door that I decided to paint teal for my friend. You know, she let me live here for free, which is really nice. And um, I had all these bills to pay. I had my car bill and my you know insurance and my benefits and all these other things to pay for, but dog food. And I had no other way to pay it, so I started working the streets for about a year. And then I, from here, uh, yeah, I like, lost all my self-worth and pretty much went down a really dark hole, resented a lot of people, was pretty angry, um, pretty angry at everybody. And it wasn't really until I started doing this porn that I started to find the right audience, the people that really understood me, people that could relate. Survival sex is, um, it has changed my entire life. I think it's really turned me into an advocate for people. Um, and so like today, you know, my career, I see it as more of an activist. I look at all of the people that are struggling in university. I look at all the people that are, um, you know, trying to just maintain their bills every day and they're doing this online and I don't think that's acceptable. I think that if, you know, you should have one job and that should be able to pay your living expenses and you shouldn't have to get with your boyfriend online to make up for those expenses. I just want people to know that I am doing what I can to survive, and I think that's what people should know. Nobody grows up thinking about being, you know, a sex worker. As a child, you don't grow up thinking that that's what you're gonna be when you grow up. And so when it happens, I think people should be a lot more compassionate and try to understand, you know, what was that avenue that took that person there and try to be a little bit more understanding towards it. So in terms of empowerment and how we understand it from an academic perspective, there's kind of two camps. One where people say empowerment is when you feel empowered. And then there's another camp that says you need to be physically, monetarily empowered. Not safe for work content and creation of their own or our own erotic content can be a way to kind of take that fetishization of our bodies and ourselves and say, hey, you know what? I'm actually gonna make money from that. Why are we penalizing people for doing the best that they can to survive? So that's the video. I wanna thank each person who participated and shared their story. I hope if there's one thing you can take from this video, it's that sex work is real work. And it's about time we start recognizing that. We all come from a different walk of life, but each one of us deserves to feel empowered. And that's that on that.